I'm going to ask you a series of questions. If you answer them honestly to yourself, you will know which one you are. Okay, sounds good. Sounds like fun one, man. Do you ever question your daily habits? Yes, all the time. What you do, what you say, what you eat, what you wear? Yeah, I'm constantly in a state of depression. Do you ever adopt a belief without considering all the available facts? No. Are you religious? No. If you are, do you practice the religion you were given at birth? I said no. Or did you research every other religion on this planet and choose the one you thought was best? Yeah, I know we're supposed to do that, but who has the fucking time? As noted in Chapter 5, many Sumerian artifacts were found in the Indus civilization in India, and Indus objects have been unearthed in Sumer. Students of ancient pottery trace several major varieties of Chinese pottery, dating from around 2000 BC to Persia. Indeed, it is regarded as established fact that the wheel reached China from Sumer more than a thousand years before the Axial Age incidental to the introduction of horse-drawn war chariots. Ideas would seem to be far more easily transported. Within India, of course, the notions developed by the new Hinduism had to travel only a very short distance to reach Mahavira and Buddha, and these two founders lived only a rather short stroll from one another. Given that Pythagoras is believed to have traveled to the east, the transmission of the principles of the new Hinduism to Greece and southern Italy is easily assumed. Although it would have been quite feasible for Zoroastrian Jewish ideas to have diffused to India, this need not be presumed since there is no convincing trace of them in the Indian inspirations, unless it was merely the notion that individual misbehavior has transcendent meaning. As for the link between China and India, we possess very plausible details of how Pure Land Buddhism was transported over the Silk Roads. So much then for the Axial Age. A far larger question has to do with the connections among faiths more generally. Can we grant all religions some degree of divine inspiration? The idea that all religions are somewhat true is popular among students of comparative religions. John Hick has long campaigned in support of the proposition that all the major faiths are equally valid, although it is not clear that he actually finds much validity in any religion. Nicholas F. Gere has heaped contempt on everyone who fails to grasp the essential equivalence of the major faiths. As for the popular Huston Smith, he claims to be a practicing believer in all the world's great religions. A lifelong Christian, he prays to Allah five times a day and practices yoga, among other things. Even such an ardent Christian as C.S. Lewis made allowance for the validity of other faiths. I cannot say for certain which bits came into Christianity from earlier religions. An enormous amount did. I should find it hard to believe in Christianity if that were not so. I wouldn't believe that 999 religions were completely false and the remaining one true. Be that as it may, the question persists. Have all religions contributed to the discovery of God? Assuming for a moment that God exists, the answer must be no. I am fully sensitive to the controversial aspects of that answer, but to answer yes is certainly as controversial and, in my judgment, far less plausible. I suggest three criteria by which it is possible to separate faiths into those that could reflect actual divine inspiration in that they increased our understanding of God and those that seem not to have been inspired. The first criterion assumes that God reveals himself. If that is not so, then there is nothing further to discuss because all faiths are entirely of human origins. But if God does reveal himself, some religions cannot claim divine inspiration. That is, some of the great founders based their teachings on what they perceived as revelations, but other religious founders rejected the possibility of revelations and presented their doctrines as their own creations, albeit sometimes they were discovered through deep meditation. It would seem appropriate to take the founders at their word and assume that those who reported no revelations lacked the means to contribute to the discovery of God. The second criterion is consistency. It is all well and good to suppose that God limits his revelations to the prevailing level of human understanding, 
but it is not plausible to suppose that his revelations are utterly contradictory. Granted that variations can arise from the transmission and interpretation of revelations, but there still should be substantial compatibility among any religions that are based on divine inspirations. Hence, faiths that greatly depart from a consistent core can be relegated to human origin. The third criterion is progressive complexity. Ordered as to when they appeared, authentic religions should reveal an increasingly sophisticated and complex understanding of God. They should form a developmental or evolutionary sequence. Put another way, revelations should not regress. Less sophisticated revelations should not follow the more complex, not even by being directed to less sophisticated society. Presumably, once material of a particular level of complexity has been revealed, it is to be communicated to less sophisticated cultures by missionizing and conversion. I now apply these criteria to the religions discussed in the previous chapters, attempting to assemble a central core of faiths. What follows assumes familiarity with the previous chapters. Major aspects of various faiths will merely be cited, not spelled out at length. Revelation. Karen Armstrong proposed that if the Buddha or Confucius had been asked whether he believed in God, he would probably have winced slightly and explained, with great courtesy, that this was not an appropriate question. She offered this as evidence of their superior wisdom and virtue. Perhaps. But it also demonstrates that they could not have made any contribution to the discovery of God. It is on these grounds that, at least in their initial form, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Taoism, and Confucianism can be excluded from the category of inspired faith. I have italicized initial because some of these faiths were later substantially transformed in ways that may reflect revelations, at least indirectly. In the case of the restored new Hinduism represented by the Bhagavad Gita, we do not know whether it originated with revelations to an unknown Indian sage or sages, was prompted by a surviving popular commitment to the traditions of the Vedas, or was inspired by the diffusion of ideas from the West. As for direct revelations, no important revelatory tradition has survived within Hinduism. As for diffusion, although there was substantial numbers of Jews and Persians on hand in India at this time, there is little in the new Hinduism that could reflect their influence. Thus, it would seem that the impetus for the return of the gods to the new Hinduism reflected the continuing popular attachment to the gods. Turn to China, a case can be made that Pure Land B Buddhism was a new religion, traditional re Buddhism having been fundamentally reshaped by Zoroaster's revelations. If so, this in turn gave a revelatory basis to Taoism and Confucianism, albeit at third hand. These possibilities suggest that there may be aspects of inspired religion present in these space. But to the extent that these were derivative of revealed re religion, they made no independent contribution to human knowledge of God. Of course, some will seek to restore the authenticity of these faiths by proposing that although the founder did not consciously experience a revelation, his teachings were divinely inspired. Consistency. As a group, the leading world religions examined in this book are not logically compatible. Some religions propose the existence of a conscious life after death. Others offer no such prospects and idealize an escape into an eternal, unconscious bliss. These views are utterly incompatible, and unless we conceive of God as irrational or wicked, at least one of them must be false. Some religious founders acknowledge the existence of many gods, albeit they placed little importance on any of them. Other founders were enthusiastic monotheists. Which one ha have it right? Some founders taught that the universe was created by God. Others claim that the universe is uncreated and eternal. Notice that in all these comparisons, the revealed religions are compatible. Progressive complexity. The principle of divine accommodation teaches that God reveals himself within the current limits of the human capacity to comprehend. Applied to the materials at hand, 
That means that over the course of history, God's revelations should pr progress from the simple to the more complex. Hence, we should not discover that some Stone Age tribes had full knowledge of Mosaic law, nor should later conceptions of God be less complex than earlier ones. When the Israelites turned from Yahweh to Baal, Astarte, Moloch, and Ashura, this did not reflect divine inspiration. This assumption leads to the conclusion that if faiths are ordered on the basis of when they began, the inspired faiths will exhibit a pattern of progress. Later faiths will tell us more about God than will earlier faiths. The best way to apply this criterion is to attempt to order the faiths not already excluded from the inspired core by the first two criteria. It would seem legitimate to begin with the belief in high gods that existed in so many early societies. Contrary to the dogmas of social evolution, very early humanity did not embrace crude superstitions of the kind Tyler called animism. Rather, as Giant Battista Vico explained, primitive religion was not nonsense, idiotic babbling, but man's first striving toward divine truth. Although they were not monotheists, many primitive groups embraced a high god who presided over a collection of lesser gods and who was believed to be the creator, not only of the universe, but often of the lesser gods as well. Moreover, unlike the gods of subsequent pagan pantheons, many of the high gods of the prehistoric times were linked to human morality. Of course, we know nothing of any revelations from this era, but it would not stretch plausibility to assume with Father Schmidt that God had revealed himself in earlier times. The subsequent rise of polytheistic temple religions was regressive. The religions of Sumer, Egypt, Greece, early Rome, and Mesoamerica have no place within the progressive core of inspired faith. It is difficult to evaluate the monotheism founded by Akhenaten. In favor of inclusion in the inspired core are these three factors. First, this religion appears to have been based on revelation. Second, it is considerably more sophisticated than the early conceptions of high gods. Third, it was not incompatible with either the prior high gods or with the subsequent monotheism. The basis for rejecting it as inauthentic is its failure to have had any lasting effects. Perhaps that is irrelevant. Perhaps, too, it is inaccurate. The monotheism that flourished during Akhenaten's reign might have contributed to a trend toward monotheism that seemed to be building in the region, even though no direct links have been discovered. Next come the ancient Hebrews. Clearly, they contributed to the discovery of God, even though they did not begin a, as full-fledged monotheists. From very early days, many influential voices were raised to proclaim the exclusive worship of Yahweh, and eventually this evolved into the celebrated Jewish monotheism. Although how much of this came prior to the Deuteronomist is very difficult to assess. In any event, the evolution of Jewish monotheism evolved involved a series of revelations. It also involved some interaction with Zoroastrianism during the Jewish sojourn in Babylon. To the extent that the reconstructed biography of Zoroaster is accurate, the religion he founded deserves a place in the common core. It involved a revelation. It was unflinchingly monotheistic. It may have been the origin of the idea of sin, in the sense that moral lapses have transcended significant. Christianity epitomizes revealed revelation and offers a substantially more complex and nuanced vision of God as is appropriate for a faith that fulfills the Old Testament and presents a more com comprehensive doctrine of salvation. Of course, Jews disagree and remain convinced that the promised Messiah is still yet to come. So too, the Parsis in India believe that Zoroaster was the last authentic prophet and, of course, Muslims disagree with them all. Thus, we confront the most difficult aspect of identifying an inspired religious core. Does Islam qualify? The most fundamental claim made by Muhammad and enshrined in the Quran is that Islam is God's final word to humanity. God never promised to send a Messiah. All faiths other than Judaism and Christianity are entirely false. And even the Jews and Christians have so corrupted God's truth that Muhammad was sent as the final prophet from God to lead humanity out of error. 
If we accept these claims, then Islam takes its place as the fulfillment of the inspired core of faiths. Perhaps the best way to resolve the matter is to ask whether Islam is progressive or regressive vis-a-vis -vis our understanding of God. It is quite unnecessary to doubt Muhammad's sincerity to conclude that the faith revealed in the Quran, having originated centuries after the other great monotheisms, is morally and theologically regressive. In sustaining theocracies and by repressing innovations, Islam resembles the temple religions of the ancient civilizations. As for discovering God, the prevailing conceptions of Allah present him as so unpredictable and unknowable that it may not even be assumed that he is rational or virtuous, which has pretty much prevented the development of an Islamic theology. It is futile to reason about the unreasonable. Some Western apologists for Islam explain these apparent deficiencies are due to the fact that Arab culture was so primitive that a more sophisticated message would have been inappropriate. But why would God have sent a regressive message to Arab tribes that were in the process of converting to Judaism and Christianity? Therefore, in accord with Criterion 3, I think it's inappropriate to include Islam in the inspired core of faiths. I accept that Muslims will condemn this judgment. And, of course, it is merely my judgment, upon which matters of faith and taste inevitably intrude. Be, too, reminded that this entire discussion of common core is based on the assumption that God exists.